Hi everyone and welcome back to The Rooftop, the home of good news worth shouting about. Sharing positive stories about issues that matter and campaigns that make a difference. I'm Tom York and this is episode four of Rooftop TV. Now, we've seen lots of positive stories in the media recently about how video calling platforms like FaceTime, Skype, WhatsApp and Zoom are helping many people feel less socially isolated during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a great thing. But what about the people who don't have a laptop or a tablet or even regular access to the internet? Older people, people who are homeless, for example. Well, there is a ray of hope out there thanks to an initiative that has been set up by a former refugee turned social entrepreneur. Here with the story, I'm pleased to welcome back Simon Francis, editor of The Rooftop. Hi, Simon. Hi, Tom. Good to be back. And yeah, this is a this is a great great story to kick off with, really. Um, as, as you mentioned in the intro, um, so many people now are relying on on video calling just to sort of have that basic human interaction. And but yet, there's so many groups who really I, social isolation and loneliness was already a, a huge issue even before the the coronavirus um, outbreak and, and pandemic and the lockdown. But you know, so this this social enterprise, Social Box, um, existed before the, the pandemic and, and was already trying to connect these isolated communities with, with people, with friends, with relatives, with, with services even, um, banks and, and councils through technology that was being donated predominantly by firms or by local authorities. And they really expanded their operation in response to the, the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, they're now looking at how universities, um, colleges, uh, how even more firms, even small businesses, you, you may only have one or two spare laptops or, you know, kind of tablets that you've just not used in, in, a, in a few years and, you know, just lying there in a box in, a, in an office somewhere. Well, they'll go and they'll pick them up and then they'll distribute them to charities that are working with, with uh, isolated and lonely people. Age UK is a big supporter of theirs and they get a lot of IT through that. So, you know, re- really great, uh, great, great, great organisation. And if you have got any um, spare IT and you, you run a firm or a university, then and have a look at socialbox.biz or, or the story on the rooftop. Top for, for more information. Thanks, Simon. Now, for our next story being a victim or a witness of a violent crime is a harrowing ordeal for anyone to have to go through, but especially so if you're a young child. And if trying to recover from the impact of crime isn't difficult enough for a child, having to give evidence in a trial in court can often be just as traumatic an experience. Well, that's why this week we were pleased to hear that the UK's first ever Child's House for Healing is about to be opened in Scotland. Now, Simon and I are pleased to welcome to the show Mary Glasgow, the Chief Executive of Children First, which is one of the charities behind the new Child's House for Healing. Hello, Mary. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Hi. So perhaps you could start just by uh, telling us what the Child's House for Healing is and and what it's all about. Okay, well, in your intro, you quite rightly described the trauma that the current court system causes child victims and witnesses of crime. Children First have supported thousands of children over the years to um, try and get justice, to become, to get safe and then to recover from that. And we were just struck over the, the decades, really, of how many children actually said, that the process of going to court to get justice was actually often more scary, more traumatic than the original event or abusive incident itself. And we just find that intolerable. It's a a horrible situation for any child. We know that court processes are difficult for adults. We also know that our courts were designed in a Victorian era to be very adversarial, to be frightening. And they're often full of adults who are in distress, of police officers, of um, people in wigs and gowns. And when children go there, Um, who are already frightened, who have already struggled to cope with what's happened. We just heard thousands, literally thousands of stories that made us think we needed to do something about that. So um, we heard about a European model of justice for children called the Barnahus, 
which is an, uh, literally a child's house, which is why ours is called a child's house for healing. And we've managed to work with a number of partners to secure money from the players of the Postcode Lottery Dream Trust, which is amazing. So we've got one and a half million pounds in order to create Britain's first um, house for healing for children. And what that is, is basically a place that looks like an ordinary house. Um, and it's a place where all the services that a child needs come to them. So currently children have to go to a police station to tell the police what's happened to them. They then might have to go and see some social workers to make sure that their family's safe. They might then have to go to a hospital building to have an examination. They might, if they're lucky, have to go somewhere else to get support to recover. But we know there's a huge shortage of support for children to recover from their ordeals. So our dream was to bring all of those services under one roof and to build a space that was child friendly, child centred, where a child, as soon as after they've told somebody that something bad has happened, can go there and police and social work come to them to take that story down in evidence. They can then have that evidence recorded and it's the recording of what's happened that goes to court so that the child never has to. So it's a real opportunity to transform, which is a horrific justice system for children. It's a really positive way to make sure that some of the most vulnerable children in our country get justice, get care and protection, but most importantly, don't have their lives blighted, their futures destroyed by what happens to them in childhood. Because we know if they get the right support at the right time, children do recover from abuse, they do recover from trauma. We just need to make sure they get the help in the right way. And we're really excited and grateful to the players of People's Postcode Lottery, but also to our other partners who are going to help us deliver on that. So we're working closely with Victim Support Scotland, with Children England um, and with the Ed Edinburgh University. And the idea is that this will be a test, learn and develop house. And then we'll um, capture all of our learning and research through how it's improved things for children and then use that learning to scale up and have these houses right the way across the country. So when our dream is that this is the first, but we'll have many and our, our passion is that no child, no child has to go to court again. Brilliant. I mean, it's such a, as I say, when I, when I saw the story in, in the inbox, I just thought, you know, it's such a, um, such an emotive story, but also um, such a good news story that sort of think positive is being done to sort of help this because, you know, you, you, the, the figures that you can mention and the, what speaks for itself. And, but I, th I think um, one of the things as well that I suppose is, is, is really um, encouraging to hear is that obviously, as you mentioned, this comes from, I think it's an Icelandic model originally. originally. Yeah kind of exists in Scandinavia and things like that and as you mentioned it's going to be all that do you, do you see there's going to be any differences between what they've done in in Iceland and Scandinavia and in and Scotland and then if it then is successful and rolled out into England and Wales and Northern Ireland you know, how do you see it changing from country to country I mean all of those countries and you're right there's about I think it's about nearly 30 countries across Europe where they have a child's house um, and all of those 30 countries will have different jurisdictions, different legislative frameworks. Most often they're much more inquisitorial than the Scottish system is. We have an adver adversarial, as you know, um, legal system. So we do have to adapt and model the approach slightly for a Scottish legal context. We also have our own processes around care and protection, around social work and around how police um, operate. What we're really excited about is we've been working for a long time alongside Scottish Government to try and create the legislative framework that would allow children to get a fairer shot at justice. So lots of improvements have already been made. In our view, they've not gone far enough and we think that this will just push that a little bit further. But we will have to think carefully, for example, about how the accused gets um, the right of cross-examination. Cross-examination is one of the particular areas that will be a challenge for us. And what's brilliant is we've got a really collaborative system around it already in Scotland. And we think the conditions are right for this. We think there's lots of progress being made. But, you know, we are dealing with an ancient, very powerful legal system. And there is some resistance in there to change. It's our job as children first, I think, to work with the children and young people um, who have these experiences and turn them into warriors and campaigners. So it's their voices that are alongside us saying, this isn't good enough, it needs to change.
And obviously at the moment, sort of timings for anything are a bit up in the air because of, of coronavirus. And I mean, but I mean, when can we expect to see it opening? When can we expect to see it all being well? When can we expect to see the expansion into the rest of the UK? So we would hope we're, we're busy in the background and all the work that we need to. We're looking for premises right now. We'll need to think about what those premises need to look and feel like. We're working very closely with children and young people so that they're involved in the design. And what we want to create is a space that is technically the best it can be so that the opportunity to give evidence, the best evidence, is captured. So we need state-of-the-art equipment to record children's interview. We need really state-of-the-art medical equipment so the forensic medical is safe and sterile and can be used in evidence. So there's a lot of conversations and work going on in the background, but we've already identified a place. We're already looking at buildings, we're already thinking about what the design would be, what would a child-centred and trauma-sensitive design look like. We'd hope to be ready to open the premises within 12 to 18 months, I think. Um, we want to get it right, so we don't want to rush it, and we've got a lot to do. Sooner than that would be fantastic, um, but definitely within sometime next year, we hope to be sharing with um, everyone what the house looks like and begin to support the many children who desperately need the service. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to hearing some more in the future. And I know, you know, we'll, we'll keep in touch and hopefully we can have you back in, in you know, a year's time and we can sort of catch up on, on how things are going. It'd be great to, to have you on again. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Thanks very much. So now for our final story, still on the topic of children, this week, we heard about a company in West Sussex that has been helping to brighten up the birthdays of kids who have had to cancel their birthday parties due to the current stay at home and social distancing rules. Simon, over to you for the details. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all, we've probably all by now had a family member who's either had a birthday or a wedding or, you know, uh, some form of celebration cancelled or postponed because of um, the lockdown and, and the social distancing that's still so important. Um, but I think uh, children, obviously, are going to be particularly affected. So um, this, this company, uh, Gamely Games in Brighton, um, they've uh, given out uh, 200 birthday presents to children who've had their parties cancelled, um, basically games for them to play, and obviously a nice surprise for them as well. Um, they've expanded the programme, and so they're giving away 100 games a month. So if you have a, a child that has got a celebration coming up that's been cancelled or had one that's been cancelled, then you can get in touch with them through their, their Facebook page. The details are in the story on, on the rooftop. Um, and they're also looking at expanding it as well to um, the children of key workers and to some of the NHS heroes as well, perhaps aren't seeing their, their parents um, as much as, as they would do normally. Um, and obviously that there's going to be stress and strain. So supporting the families of, of those those key workers as well. So so really, really great intervention from uh, from, a, from a really nice firm um, down in Brighton. That's wonderful. Thanks, Simon. Um, well, that's that's nearly all we've got time for this week. But um, just Simon, if there's any uh, stories that you're you're working on next week that you can give us a little taster about. Yeah, next week we've got a couple of stories about apps and websites that are going to help you. So uh, I think we've seen quite a lot of new apps and, and technology launch in the last sort of you know four or five weeks, and um, we've got a couple of, of nice stories about um, really good apps that might be able to help you, and also uh, a story um, about some Walthamstow residents down in London who um, are kind of creating um, PPE for um, carers um, to help them. So uh, lots of great stories, and we're getting you know just so many stories um, from from the public from um, social media, from charities, from social enterprises, from private firms about the amazing work that's that's happening around the country. And, and you know, we can only feature so many, but as we say every week, please do continue to send your stories to us and we'll do our best to feature as many as, as we can. That's fantastic. Uh, thanks, Simon. Well, that really is all we've got time for this week. I'm Tom York. He's Simon Francis, as usual. And this is The Rooftop the home of good news worth shouting about. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.